Now so far we've concentrated sort of on how simple a camera is, but did you know that there's thousands of ways to make a camera? Like people have already come up with thousands of ways to make a camera. I think that's so fascinating. When I'm out on the street sometimes I'll see someone walk by taking photos and I'll be just staring at their camera wondering like, wow, how did they do that? Um, maybe it's just a sign that I'm a photographer or maybe that I'm a nerd, but I don't know. I think I share that with a lot of people out there. I'll, in this lesson, we're going to talk about some of the different types of cameras that there are out there, some of the types that have been used in the past, the ones that are being used now. So stay tuned for that. Let's get started, though, and start with the grandparent of these two cameras here. I started with a cell phone with a digital camera in it and a Nikon DSLR, but these cameras have a great, 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 great grandmother, and her name is the pinhole camera. This right here is a pinhole camera. We've talked about the pinhole camera a little bit uh, when we talked about the history of the camera. Basically there's just a little tiny pinhole, like a little poke right there in a piece of, probably in a piece of metal that they've put inside. They have this paper spread around in the back of this oatmeal box. They expose it to a little bit of light, they take the paper out, pop it in these tubs right here with some chemicals and then they have a photograph and basically it just all works on this principle that you're seeing over here to the right you've got a little hole light focuses through that hole onto the back in this case of the oatmeal box and you've got a picture now moving up from there cameras became very quickly much more complex and this camera over here to the left is an example of one of the sort of early styles of camera. This camera itself is actually, I think, a little newer, but this is what's called a large format camera. So a large format camera, basically, all that has to do with is the film size. It doesn't necessarily have to do with, not every large format camera looks exactly like this, but th a large format camera has a large piece of film in the back of it. So it's going to be like the size of like a pretty good sized book or something like that. Sitting in the back, the light goes through the lens, lands on the film, blah, you got a picture. And a little bit smaller than that, you're going to move over here to the right, and you've got a medium format. So you'll hear these words a lot, medium and large format, you're going to hear 35 millimeter, and all of these just have to do with film size. So right here you see a 35 millimeter film, and this, and it's not 3.5, it's 35. And right here you've got 120 millimeter film. And a m medium format is generally around 120 millimeters. There's some other different sizes, random sizes, but 120 is a pretty standard medium format camera. And you can see here, this camera is also a TLR, but we'll talk about what that is in a second. The most important thing to know right now is that it is a medium format camera. Now we're going to go back a tiny bit. So right after the pinhole camera, right behind the pinhole camera was the box camera. And the box camera is basically just a little tiny lens on the front of a box. And they're probably like something like two spools of film right here, or one where the film is coming from and where one where it is going. Back here somewhere, the film just kind of goes in a big horseshoe shape like that. and. Um, Back here somewhere, there's a spot where the film is sort of flattened, and the light goes through, boing, shoots onto the film, and you've got a picture. And then when you're done, you advance it. And that is just basically, I mean, this was a huge period of time when photography was just done on little box cameras like this, and they were very popular. You can see they've got a little handle. You could carry it with you on a picnic or wherever you're going, and they were a big deal. Now, right here to the right, you see a folding camera. And this folding camera happens also at the same time to be a medium format camera. So it's, I think, a 120, something like that. And uh, so the film goes inside. Um, you pop out this lens when you want to use it. And when you're done, you just basically take this and push the lens back inside. You don't touch the glass, but you push the lens back inside. And this door goes up, closes, and there you go. Now, doing the research, I came across what is literally my favorite camera of all time, and I really kind of want to go find one if I can. Uh, this is called a pigeon camera. I didn't even know these things existed. But a pigeon camera is basically made for spies. So this little guy right here is totally a spy. 
and he's spying for either the Germans or the Brits, and they would basically strap these cameras onto these poor little pigeons and send them out across their enemy territory, uh, enemy's territory and try to get pictures, reconnaissance pictures, so that they could make battle plans and things like that. You can see his little wings are coming into the frame here in this one picture as he's flying over this really cool castle. Um, and you can see also the lens was really wide angle. This here, we'll talk about lenses in another lesson, but you can see this is a very wide angle lens. And they basically just send these guys out on these like sort of suicide photography missions over over Europe. So fascinating. I didn't know it existed. I was really excited when I found it, although I feel bad for the poor pigeons. Um, so moving away from aerial photography, we'll get down to some really very, very practical cameras that are still often in use today. Um, to the right, you find what is probably, I guess, among a certain generation of photographers, really the standard, the rangefinder right here. And we'll talk about how the rangefinder works in a second, but then first we're, I'm going to give you the names of these other ones here. We've got the twin lens reflex. And right here we've got the single lens reflex. Now, let's start with, hmm, where should we start? We'll start with the twin lens reflex. The twin lens reflex is really cool because basically it's built with the idea of having one lens for a viewfinder. So this is the lens for your viewfinder. And this lens is for your film. So here's your film down here and that goes so the the picture being taken is through this lens and it goes onto the film back here. But the picture is not being taken through this lens through this, this lens, you're just getting the image. It's kind of giving you a preview, trying to give you the same image that this lens is giving you. And the person using the camera standing sort of above it, you're like holding it like on your stomach maybe, looking down into here. And you can see on the bottom of this, we can't see it, but the person holding the camera can see a little viewfinder. It's like sort of um, like the screen on a digital camera, poking it, pointing up towards you. So it's flat and looking at, you're looking down on it. And you can see what this lens can see, which is, uh, in theory, about the same thing as this lens on the bottom. So that's a twin lens reflex. Now, at some point, someone decided to try to get rid of the second lens, and they did with the single lens reflex. And basically, they've done that by, um, we've talked about this already in the sort of how camera works lesson, the light comes in, it hits a mirror down here before it hits the film, gets bounced up into a prism, and then shot back out the viewfinder. So the viewer looks inside and can see exactly what this lens can. Um, but that it's they're basically the same exact thing. They're just sort of one is a fancier, more technical version of the other. Now over here to the left is probably sort of the, the grandmother of photography. It's sort of the one that a lot of the really amazing photographs of the last century were made on is the rangefinder. This Leica happened to have been a very important um, company in developing um, a really great rangefinder, and were sort of was sort of like the professional favorite of a lot of photographers. Now, the rangefinder, instead of being able to see through a lens, you are see through the lens of the of the camera, like on the single lens reflex. On the rangefinder, you're looking through sort of a viewfinder that's right here. They're called the rangefinder. So you can you're seeing out of this your eyes behind here as the photographer, and the camera, the film, is seeing out of this lens right here. And in theory, they've tried to design them so that the viewfinder matches the lens. Uh, not always perfectly possible, and also especially for photographing things up close, you didn't know we weren't always able to do that. But that kind of gives you an idea of what a rangefinder was. These are still in use, and a lot of people buy them and use them, but they're not quite as popular as the single lens reflex, which it, or ref, reflex, which has um, really kind of taken over as one of the sort of under among professionals, really the camera to use. Now, most people are going to have the option between basically two types of cameras. This right here is a point and shoot. And this is a digital. SLR. So you guys remember single lens reflex, single lens reflex. So the point and shoot camera is a simplified version of the digital SLR. They're basically, this, the, the point and shoot tries to contain everything inside of one little box. You don't have to change the lens. You don't have to do anything. It's 
and they're also oft often, but not always, um, a little bit more automated so that you don't have to make as many choices. Um, the, uh, the plus of a point-and-shoot camera is that you it is a little bit more automatic and a little bit uh, a little bit more done, f set up for you. Uh, digital SLRs now often have automatic settings and have sometimes better automatic settings than point and shoots, but they're also more expensive, so you have to think about money as well. In terms of usability, the digital SLR is going to give you a lot more options. It's going to give you the, a lot of control over things that you can't control on the point and shoot. Now, also, another option that we have, which um, we didn't have before, are cell phones. Cell phones are taking better images every day. Um, each model that comes out, it's more it's amazing uh, how good the little digital cameras on them are getting. So I would really encourage you, if you don't have the money to buy a point and shoot or a digital SLR, to start with your cell phone because almost every new camera has one and, or uh, sorry, <laughs> almost every new phone has one. Um, I think of them just as cameras. <laughs> but pretty much every cell phone has a camera on it now, and it's a great way to practice. I use mine as a notebook all the time. All right, so that was your introduction to all the different types of cameras that there are out there. In the next lesson, we're going to talk about how to pick out a good digital camera. This is mostly a digital class, so we're going to show you how to do that.